Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Before we begin, I would like to introduce everyone to Carrie Sarver. Carrie is our sign language interpreter here to assist anyone who needs her help. To keep Carrie on your screen, you will need to pin her picture. To do this, place your cursor over her picture and three small dots will appear on the right corner of her picture. Click on the three dots, then select pin. Carrie will then be on your screen for the entire presentation. Okay, let's begin. Thank you for joining our Hawaii Career and Resiliency Education Support webinar. My name is Elise Matsumoto and I am honored to be here today to serve as your High Cares moderator. Also here for you today are fellow High Cares team members, Michael Mosier, Aaron Thompson, Loretta Chen, Tad Psyche, Cheryl Ball, and Will Costello. High Cares seeks to develop a resilient workforce by providing education, innovative resources, and workforce development opportunities in partnership with our community contributors and alliances. Our webinar today will be approximately an hour long. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat room. If you wish to remain anonymous, please send me your questions via private chat. At this time, could you please make sure your microphones are on mute? Thank you. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Maya Sutoro. Maya is an associate specialist with the Spark Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, as well as a consultant for the Obama Foundation. Maya develops peace education curriculum for students and teachers. She is the co-founder of Seeds of Peace, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to raise future peace-building leaders. We're so blessed to have Maya here with us this morning. I know all of you are eager to hear from her, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Auntie Maya. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you to the whole High Cares team for having me here. I'm really excited to be here with you, and we're going to have fun. I feel like we really need to um, redefine happiness, and it may have very little, in fact, I suspect, to do with some of the ways that people are choosing to uh, spend their time and give their attention. And um, the truth is that if we remember our true definitions of happiness, um, that uh, all of that is, is, is within reach. Now, happiness doesn't rid of us of suffering, right? So we may think we're doing it wrong or we're failing in happiness if we are suffering, um, but that's not true. And, and many of us are suffering now. But um, the, the idea with happiness is, of course, uh, in part uh, to learn the art of suffering. When we acknowledge, embrace, and understand um, our suffering, uh, we are able to transform it into understanding, into compassion for self and other, uh, and uh, find a measure of uh, both personal peace and interpersonal peace, um, and on top of that, peace and community. That is the seeds of peace algorithm, this notion of building peace within, between, and in service, is my definition of happiness. Um, and I have to tell you, I often say I am drenched with gratitude. I have uh, really, found myself at age 50 uh, always happy. I have a friend who every time I ask uh, him how he's doing will respond in the same way. He'll say, never had it so good. And at first I thought this was just a little funny thing, this silver lining thinking, this trick, um, and uh, something that he said but did not feel. And then I realized actually he means it, that no matter what is happening around him, no matter the maelstrom, he manages to find um, a certain steadiness. Uh, in part, it's because he's able to uh, be kind to himself and to nurture that kindness through gratitude and optimism and turn negative situations into positive. So I want, I want you to write in the chat room now, 
and, and take 30 seconds if you need to really think about it. How are you during this time being kind to yourself? All right, take 30 seconds and, and, and do that. These are excellent ways, exercising regularly, getting sleep, being outside, taking time to do things for yourself and, and, and not um, having a checklist mentality, crocheting, so arts, working with your uh, hands, working with the high cares team with positivity. So doing something purposeful that improves the lives of others, um, learning new things on YouTube, reflecting, reading, cooking more, uh, and nourishing your body, making lay, dancing hula, singing mele, um, gardening, um, planting, making things grow. Um, I think that these are all excellent things, walking, sleeping a lot. Well, one thing that I've noticed is that um, it is really critical that we make sure that we not only say that we're going to do these things or express a desire or understand the value of them, but really put them in our calendars and do them and then reflect on the value of it. I spent a long time uh, thinking how I live in Hawaii and I don't really go to the ocean very much. When my mother was diagnosed with cancer in 1994, I bought her a bathing suit at Liberty House. You guys remember Liberty House, some of you? Um, but I took her to the ocean and she twirled in the ocean on her back and she looked up at the sky and she spent maybe six hours in the water. And I said, you know, I was shivering. I was like, Ma, I'll take you back another time. Can I think, you know, the sun was going down and she said, well, you don't understand. I haven't been in the ocean for um, 15 years because I didn't want anyone to see my cellulite um, and it was a heartbreaking moment for me um, I, and I of course said I'm not going down like that uh, that will never happen and of course in fact it did you know when I um, quit smoking when I got stressed when, when I, I gained weight and went up and down and I didn't go into the ocean, so now I really put it in my schedule. I make it a point to um, think, um, even if I wake up and I say, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really busy, I need to get online and get work done, I think about how um, mom felt at that moment, the sense of freedom she had with her body, the sense of connection that she felt with nature, and I, and I really do commit to, um, to that time for myself, and, and I, um, I don't miss it anymore. Um, and right now, I feel like we need a lot of silver lining thinking, but we also need practical strategies um, to ensure that uh, we are taking actions are beneficial and conducive to personal peace or peace with it. We can say to ourselves in terms of thinking, oh, you know, I'm bored or the kids are driving me crazy or I'm afraid, um, you know, or we can embrace the fact that this pandemic is a, a river, not resist it, uh, you know, and have a growth mindset. So I want you guys to really part of personal peace, and I'm going to do those three things sort of happiness is personal peace or personal happiness, interpersonal, and peace and community and, and connection. But I, I really want you, in terms of personal peace, to think about your self talk. And, you know, I, I want you to uh, think about how you're viewing yourself and you're viewing this time. And there's a, uh, 
a phrase that I use all the time, it's to wash the eyes. And a big part of personal happiness, as I see it, is learning to wash your eyes. And, and um, uh, you know, that means no catastrophizing. You don't predict negative outcomes. If there's something that is, um, and no black and white thinking or, um, you know, uh, all, all sorts of um, uh, unhelpful, um, anxiety-inducing uh, ways of, of talking ourselves into uh, thinking too far ahead or living in the future in the past. Um, I think that, uh, or of thinking in absolutes. A big part, therefore, of course, is regenerating a sense of optimism through alternative hypotheses, I think. So reframing bad things to think about what you learn from them, how you grow from them. You know, any incident is an opportunity to teach, grow, learn, connect, and deepen compassion. So there is um, this Mind Body Institute in Detroit, Michigan, that was started by a man named Howard Schubner. And my friend Scott Kroshige was talking to me one day and he said, you know, and I was complaining about my carpal tunnel and my back pain. And um, he said, you know what, I had carpal tunnel, I had back pain, I had um, uh, acid reflux, which I also had. And he said, these are often symptomatic of um, the sort of mind-body connection and psychosomatic um, illness. And I said, psychosomatic, but, you know, I said, come on, that's, I'm feeling this pain. This pain is real. I'm not imagining it. He said, no, no, the pain is real. He said, but I think there might be a mind-body connection. In other words, the impact of stress is enhancing the pain and making you. And so he asked me to go see when I was visiting a school in Detroit, um, uh, to go see Howard and Howard took me through this process where um, he had me think through every single relationship that was important in my life, uh, family and, and uh, lovers and, and my children and um, my parents, of course. And he had me uh, one by one think about what happened in that relationship. Did, you know, was I um, happy or unhappy in this relationship? What I wished could have happened in this relationship? Um, and then he had me kind of write down or um, uh, speak out loud the, the, the story of, of my hopes, my disappointments, and then throw that away, either by tearing up what I had written down or um, breathing the story into the air and letting it fly or imagining it. And then he said, this was the important part, he said, um, make sure that you think about uh, what you have learned from that relationship uh, or from the incident and, that you shared with this person and then um, make note of what you will do with what you have learned. So this was an elaborate reframing exercise, which I invite you to try. Um, if you are struggling, um, we, I think, hold so much more in our bodies than we realize. And, and uh, it is sometimes difficult to simply um, intellectualize our way out of um, pain or suffering or sorrow. Uh, we have to, in some way, loosen uh, whatever is, um, you know, harming our spirit or traumatizing us and in order to find physical comfort. Uh, alternatively, it is also important, I think, uh, to think of the body as a conduit for finding happiness and peace. Mindfulness, of course, is... Uh, on my mind and it's just the quality of awareness that comes from paying attention to yourself and the world around you, paying attention on purpose, to this present moment in a non-judgmental way, whatever arises arise, let whatever is be, it's an energy you can generate all day long and I tell you when I wake up in the morning, um, I feel like I can 
you know, drink my coffee, do the dishes, look out the window, um, touch the many um, moments in my day um, with a measure of artistry, with mindfulness. So those are definitely two things. One is addressing those relationships in your life um, in order to help heal your body or the trauma to move uh, often from sadness, suffering, disappointment to sort of, or trauma to post-traumatic growth, having that growth mindset. And then using mindfulness to reconnect with your body. My daughter was feeling a measure of anxiety about my death. And I said to her, sweetheart, I will die before you. But um, think about all the amazing, powerful, beautiful moments of connection that we can have in the meantime. And together, we sat and we did an exercise called two, 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 uh, which is just finding two things you can taste, two things you can smell, two things you can touch, two things you can hear, and engaging all of those senses. And sometimes when we're cooking together, um, we create joy and happiness just through that awareness. Or you can do five, four, three, two, one. Sometimes it's helpful to do a countdown five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things, and so on. And that enables us, I think, to kind of talk ourselves down. We do body scan together, um, where we just start at the top of our heads, go down to the bottom of our toes, or sometimes bottom of our toes to the top of our heads, and we progressively relax each part of the body. Um, in 1992, the World Health Organization highlighted the economic and social burden of depression, um, and that's when you know um, John Kabat-Zinn did a lot with his mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and there's lots of videos you can access, and John is uh, a great guy, a friend, and he is, taking time to do daily um, uh, conversations um, that are free uh, during this time to help those who are struggling. Um, that's one resource I recommend. Um, I do think that um, uh, there is a tendency that we have to take whatever is going wrong during this time time and amplify it, right? That catastrophizing and awfulizing and a big um, way to address that is through practices of gratitude as well as mindfulness. So writing down in your journal um, every day, you know, kind of three things that you're grateful for helps you to refocus and reframe. Um, mindfulness remember is not just about sitting still and meditation though those things are great but you can do uh, mindful walks uh, take notice of uh, the ground around you the air but also uh, perhaps things in motion um, those kinds of things help you to feel less trapped um, if you are feeling um, trapped but basically i i think that um, so much of um, my suffering uh, is about thinking too much about what I wish could have happened or the people I've lost, the things I wanted to say or hear from them, and then also looking too far in the future, thinking I will be happy when, or I will be peaceful when, and that has led to many moments of overwhelm. And these two girls are the loves of my life. The younger one struggled with um, some night tantrums. And I went once to go visit my friend in the back of Kalihi at the uh, Zen monastery there where she was studying Zen archery. And she introduced me to a music teacher who had me listening to all sorts of songs, different kinds of music, some lovely and lilting, others, um, you know, intense and, and rhythmic. And he had me think about where those songs were taking me. And then he had me think of the songs and in terms of single notes, single points of light, uh, or drops of water on my face, 
um, if you think about music in terms of now, 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 that music doesn't have the capacity to take you anywhere, you know? It is uh, simply a note, a sound. It's when you string them together that you are rushing this way or that down the stream. And I realized that with my daughter, I had been afraid. I was afraid that I wasn't a good enough mother. I was afraid that she wouldn't be happy. And I was thinking and projecting so far into the future. And um, I was probably contributing to her anxiety. I was certainly deepening my own. And that is um, an important lesson from mindfulness. So when she had her tantrums, instead of um, worrying, I started really paying attention to the curve of her cheek, the bed of her nail, the length of her eyelash, and even took a mindful quality to the sound of her voice, marveling at its strength and wrapping my arms around her and simply being with her, being not afraid of her pain or mine, um, and cradling her suffering. Um, in order for us both to dwell in the present moment. Uh, and I think if you look deeply into any fearful attachments you may have right now, uh, you realize that it is really this attachment to things being a particular way or excessive worry about the future that is the obstacle to any joy or happiness you might claim. So finding ways to let that go um, either through that process that um, the Mind Body Institute taught me of writing down what you wish or you're worrying and then letting it go in some ceremonial way um, or doing whatever works for you. Uh, but once you let go, I think happiness can come quickly. So I want to take one minute now and I want you to take something in your mind and I'm going to get off video. I want you to turn your hell into a heaven. And what that is, is just practice this exercise of taking something difficult. And like my daughter's tantrums, and thinking about how you can reframe that, um, bring negative to positive, and find the heaven that is embedded there. With um, my daughter, when I was being mindful with her, I was able to notice her, be with her, earn her trust, deepen my connection to her, uh, feel um, the strength of her story. Uh, I was able to think about her resilience and to admire her. Um, and um, uh, I feel like I have become so much closer to her as a result. Um, obviously, during this quarantine, with all of the loss of life, opportunity, income, there's a lot of suffering. We have to think about the beloved community that we will have and build together after this. In order to do that, you folks all have to claim um, your happiness and think about turning your hell to heaven so that you can conjure a sense of commitment to what you're going to build, uh, to how you're going to live differently, to you know how you're going to learn from this, how you're going to grow from this, and sort of remake uh, or, or create, a, for the first time, uh, a paradise in your own mind. Um, we're so capable of compassionate understanding, um, joy, but when we pay attention to just the negative things, uh, past hurts, present suffering, we wallow in those sorrows, and it's very hard to positively nourish ourselves. So, but there's a way to do this that's not Pollyanna, right? That's embedded in real, um, uh, in, in our real capacity to, to turn heaven to hell. It's not just about taking something that really sucks, and saying, oh, it's all right, or taking an awful moment and saying, I'm fine. Uh, and it's not about always looking cheerful, but it is about genuinely finding a measure of, of, uh, of gratitude and insight from um, difficult moments, struggle and suffering. So I'm gonna take one minute, I'm gonna go off video, and I want you to practice turning um, hell to, to heaven. You don't need to put anything in the chat, but just give this time to yourself.
Go ahead. Well, I hope that you folks um, are thinking um, about uh, trying to adopt or, uh, you know, uh, absorb these practices in the future. A big takeaway I hope that you have is this notion about, you know, the body is an ecosystem. When it's put out of balance, you know, disease occurs and, and right now, um, you know, the, there's, um, we're experiencing a lot of, um, imbalance. Um, and so part of it is reconnecting our, 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 our body and thinking about illness and thinking about breath, um, as something to which all of us fortunately, um, have been, um, granted access. Many people who are struggling with COVID-19 don't have breath, but re-engaging your breath is something that is um, vitally important. So do big belly breaths, I would, I would say, um, every day where you let your belly expand as you take your breath in. You can find so many guided meditations and great apps online, but you can also do it yourself. Um, I'm sure many of you on this call already have a lot of skills and tools, but I'm happy to share more with you if you need after this. Um, um, I also wanted to talk about that piece with it, between, or happiness between, interpersonal happiness. And this is an important time for us to recognize our interconnectedness. This is not a time for us to be selfish or closed off to others, right? This is... Um, something that we're in danger of doing as we're closing borders and afraid of physical contact and um, finding, uh, uh, you know, that we don't have access anymore to hugs and touch, you know. It, um, this is though a time for us to really think, um, I think in deep ways about our interbeing, about the fact that what happens far away impacts us so much and what, what we do has the capacity to impact others in such profound ways. So one of the things that um, we're seeing is a lot of people are offering their gifts online, um, their artistry. There's so much that we can do, each of us us can blog vlog we can self-publish we can you know reach out in in new ways um, I do think this is therefore um, the key to happiness this notion of um, ensuring that we are reaching out more than we have before um, that in terms of interbeing we we let go of uh, narrow-mindedness and our views that we continue to learn someone put in the chat that that um, there's a lot of learning that can happen with through YouTube. Um, continue to learn, invigorate your mind, but all, not just learning how you know DIY projects or new uh, things to bake, but also learn about the experience of others, learn about the culture, the community, the artistry of others. Um, and in, in a way, this is about practicing non-attachment with your own views. Uh, my hope is that this is a time where we can um, deepen our connection to our own traditions, our own faith, but also really become aware of the importance of dialogue and avoid 
you know, um, getting sort of hardened uh, to the way things have always been done and instead open to the richness and diversity of other traditions that can enrich our own, but also to new ways of being. This is a time for us to be explorers with one another. And with, you know, this is a time when real dialogue continues to be possible. Um, one of the things that mom, when she was a week away from death, she said to me, Maya, I always thought that I wanted to be buried under a beautiful tree atop a hill. She said, but I've changed my mind. I want you to put me into the ocean because how else am I gonna to get to all the people and the places I love so much? And so we did, we scattered her ashes at Lanai Point and put her in the ocean so that the Pacific could take her um, to all of the places she lived and worked uh, throughout Asia and to all of the people and communities she learned to love. And I think that uh, she loved, above all, these dialogue between Joseph Campbell, who lived in Hawaii, of course, and um, someone in the chat put who he had a dialogue with, but it was called The Power of Myth. And a lot of it was about our, um, who I'm trying to remember who interviewed Joseph Campbell with The Power of Myth. But it was a series of interviews that, um, that she latched on to. It was very Jungian, and a lot of it was about um, really having a um, uh, recognition of the patterned ways that all human beings live and the shared universal needs that we all possess. So it was looking at different patterns in the textiles or in the, in the art of the communities, the way houses are built or religious symbols and so forth. And it was a lot about that sort of interbeing as Thich Nhat Hanh, the, um, the Zen monk um, from Vietnam, um, uh, often speaks of this notion that um, interbeing is a critical way to stop us from feeling lonely and it is a critical way to reassert our connection and commitment not just to all other humans but indeed also to nature and in so doing we heal and balance ourselves through nature's designs um i mentioned uh, on a on another call last month that my current fascination with biomimicry and you guys can go to the biomimicry Institute and watch a lot of videos. It is so interesting how nature-based solutions give us so much. And of course, our indigenous community, Kanaka Mali here, but also um, other indigenous communities and, and um, help us to understand the value of Malama Aina and Aloha Aina. So we are really well poised to think about um, that connection. A lot of what we um, I think a lot of what makes us sick is a failure to uh, make use of that important um, healing opportunity. Um, I'm, forest bathing is something that I did start to do, started in Japan. It is for me a, a, a new and interesting way to contemplate interbeing. I go and I connect with the forest uh, through a series of invitations that are extended to find a treasure that the forest has left for you or to uh, find a tree that speaks to you or that reminds you of another time in your life, an invitation to contemplate your uh, earliest connections with nature, how you climbed trees and ran across the rice fields as a kid. In my case, it was the rice fields. But if you think about interbeing, the point is nature is full of examples. Um, soil is a wonderful ecosystem with billions of organisms. The forest is a perfect ecosystem. Nutrients go up a tree and into the leaves, and then the leaves fall down, broken up by microorganisms, by fungi. If you guys haven't already, go watch the movie Fantastic Fungi, which is really fun about the power of fungus. And then it all goes back into the soil and feeds the tree. And so living, I think, with a recognition of that 
mind and an awareness of all of that is very useful for happiness. Um, another um, uh, tool for happiness um, between or interpersonal happiness for me is um, NBC or um, nonviolent communication. Again, there are a lot of tools and resources that you can find um, online. The basic thing that I did with all of my students in uh, conflict management and peace education classes is uh, to think about what are our universal needs. Universal needs are non-controversial. Um, these are things that everyone needs and to which everyone is entitled. And I want you guys in the chat to write down perhaps what you think of as universal needs. Now these are um, not to be conflated or confused with pathways to getting those needs, right? So a universal need might be shelter or safety, right? And, or freedom or choice. Um, and money might be a way to have freedom, right? But money is not a need, right? So money is uh, a way to achieve perhaps a universal need. Um, when we think of um, connection and love, those are universal needs. Um, sex is not a need, right? It is one way to perhaps bring you closer to feel connected. Um, so you understand what a universal need is and, and if you can just take 30 seconds and write down in the chat a universal need that comes to mind. These are great. Yeah, Bill Moyer interviewed James, Joseph Campbell. Thank you. <laughs> love, safety, health, community, pure air, food, love, um, people, companionship, a sense of belonging. Absolutely. Friendship. I think happiness is a universal need. <laughs> Sleeping, eating shelter, expressing oneself, voice, safety, connection. So these are great, and they are indeed all universal needs, in my view. I think that beauty, um, I always have my students write down, and, and they will um, come up with um, things that are very tangible, and then they will also come up with lots of stuff that's esoteric, right, or ephemeral, or, or um, you know, stuff like hope, purpose, um, respect. Um, and they are all equally valuable. Um, and so one of the things that I then do is I challenge them to think about any conflict and it is um, always my goal to get them to think about really difficult conflict. But the idea is to recognize the shared humanity here, and in doing so, open up possibilities for real understanding, communication, connection, empathy. And um, that's something that you can do for interpersonal happiness if there are people who you do not understand if there are disagreements you have with people who are refusing to wear masks or who are, um, you know, you feel uh, overstepping the bounds of government or uh, who are not doing enough to protect or um, tourists who are here and, you know, you feel not and not doing the quarantine and who are disrespectful. You know, so there's all sorts of anger. There's discrimination that's taking place against Asian Americans and others in our country. There's a lot of divisiveness. 
it's an important opportunity for you to begin thinking about building interpersonal peace and happiness, regardless of whether the other side is meeting you there. Um, I've had a couple of rather incredible experiences of um, finding out that the person who was my bully online, who <laughs> was um, making me very sad, was in fact a loving grandmother and a loving um, cat lover. <laughs> I have a cat as well. And so I recognized her shared humanity and, and you know, tried to think about her need for, um, uh, for uh, freedom and justice and all of these things um, that were the source of her um, actions. And it was very helpful. I could also do it in addition to doing it with someone who is a stranger or near stranger. I can do it with um, my husband and my children to think about in the middle of our argument about money, uh, what is you know, my husband's need? Well, it is to be free from um, worry. Um, it is to be free from you know, the, uh, the burden of uh, being the only one worrying about money because I don't seem to worry about things. And my need at that moment was to be, to feel more important than money, right? So when I recognize his need, he recognizes that I need to feel like he loves me more than money, then there's room for conversation. So, um, so take 30 seconds and think about, um, uh, how a conflict in your life and how perhaps you can utilize the strategy of identifying and starting with um, universal needs um, to soften your gaze in order to create interpersonal peace, regardless of whether the other person is experiencing it or even aware of it. Okay, I wish I could give you more time, but I am running out of time and I want to leave um, a few minutes for um, questions. So I just want to talk about the last piece. For me, is this is the um, sort of collective or communal happiness. This notion of recognizing how we're all going through something together um, and how we can participate in building a movement for collective happiness. As I said, that New York Times article, check it out. It's entitled, Our Pursuit of Happiness is Killing the Planet. <laughs> but um, I want to talk about positive peace. So negative peace is the absence of conflict. Positive peace is the presence of relationships, um, infrastructure, um, understanding, education, all of these positive things. Um, that are being built, that are present, that are nurtured um, in an ongoing way to build sustainable peace. So it's not just um, the absence of conflicts. And it's important, I think, that for this collective happiness, um, the collective side on our planet, to for us to think about our responsibility and to think about um, our purpose. Um, so there's, there's, in my view, nobody on this call is um, without real purpose. Your lives all have meaning. Um, I think that the important thing is to learn to live in alignment with that purpose. So, um, you know, there, 
you're all peace building leaders, in my view, as long as you claim that title. I often have my leadership students to tell me if they are leaders and they often say no because they don't have some uh, position of leadership that has been assigned or publicly acknowledged, but they are in fact all when they choose to participate, right? Um, so there's Jody, uh, there, there's this quote, heroes didn't leap tall buildings or stop bullets with an outstretched hand. They didn't wear boots and capes. They bled and they bruised and their superpowers were as simple as listening or loving. Heroes were ordinary people who knew that even if their own lives were impossibly knotted, they could untangle someone else's. And maybe that one act could lead someone to rescue you right back. And um, there's an article which um, I'll, I'll put in the chat. Um, it's happiness through meaning and, and purpose. You know, um, it's a lot of it is about mindfulness and social justice. But these tools are not simply about, um, uh, you know, happiness that is, um, that is personal, but it can be collective. This inner being um, that Thich Nhat Hanh writes about is sort of an engaged spirituality. It's not about paths to personal awakening, right? The, um, or inner work, but it's about awareness that extends uh, to engagement um, in the world, uh, aimed at um, redressing social suffering and injustice. And so a lot of um, this engaged spirituality is about thinking about the ethical engagement, the structural nature of suffering, um, offering and receiving supportive practices and collaborating across um, differences, working with others um, to um, re relieve suffering. Um, Solnit, Rebecca Solnit, I think is her first name. Um, there was an on being, and I, I wrote uh, some wonderful notes from her interview on on being, which was before the coronavirus impacted us so heavily, but it spoke to it, and she in this interview, which I recommend you go um, check out, uh, spoke about the purposefulness and connectedness that can bring joy even amid chaos, right? But it's about more openness, better questions, tools um, that, that are commensurate with both the tragedies and the possibilities of this time. So um, anyway, a lot of what she was talking about was there's so much work that love has to do in life. And, um, and that when we come face to face with uncertainty or disaster that throws people into um, a sort of shattered immediacy, she called it. And we realize how much we rely on neighbors, community and the rest of the world and the crisis sort of shakes us awake. And um, so one of the things that I, do is um, another one is Pema Chodron when things fall apart. That's a great one. Uh, she talks about the futility of seeking lasting security through pleasure and uh, seeking and avoiding pain. So she talks about giving up hope um, that this way of thinking can ever be satisfying or lead to happiness in the long run. Um, and um, helps us to kind of um, rethink happiness um, in a very connected way. But one thing that I do, I was starting to say, and then I have to stop, is I get my students to do uh, the one thing. And that is where they look forward to their own death. And so I believe happiness <laughs> really requires that we engage with the idea of our own demise. And at, on your deathbed, you look back at your life and you find three things that really, really matter, the three things that were most important to you um, in life. And then you take a very deliberate pen to paper and write down everything that you did yesterday. 
and you identify where did you act in accordance with one of those three things that were most important? And if you didn't, then that's a problem. And then every day you make a commitment to do one thing that is in service of one of those three things that is most important. Again, this is about planning it, scheduling it, putting attention and spotlight on the things that matter most and minimizing all of the clutter, that checklist mentality, and the things that might make you feel overwhelmed. And in doing so, you often name your life's purpose in ways that can make you feel like you have contributed to the collective happiness of all because you are an important piece of the puzzle. I have to stop, but um, thank you for this time. Back to you, Elise. Okay, thank you, Maya, for such an uplifting and motivating presentation. Um, at this time, we do have a couple of questions that came through, so we can hopefully get to at least a couple of them. The first one would be, these practices are so meaningful in our everyday personal lives. How would you recommend introducing some of these practices in the workplace so that it becomes a part of the office's culture? Great question. I do think that that speaks to the fact that we are all leaders right now and that if we begin seeing ourselves as peace building leaders, regardless of our profession uh, or course of study, that we begin to step into um, that position and lean into our discomfort. So I would say um, just bring it up, uh, share things that have worked for you. Um, create and request space and time during staff meetings. Uh, begin finding people to be your thought partners in the workplace and try out new things together and then talk to others about how that has helped your life um, and um, made things better and contribute to that culture in the way that you set up your desk, in the way that you communicate, in the invitations that you extend. Okay, that's perfect. Well, we have time. We have just enough time for one more question. Um, this person writes, I love your energy, Maya. Thank what you. are some what are some daily practices you use to maintain soul balance? Um, have you added any new mindfulness or peace sustaining practices to your routine during these unprecedented stressful COVID times? Well, I have, um, I have recommitted to nature because that's something that we've been um, permitted and I wasn't giving myself the time to do that. And um, part of what I do is um, when I wake up, I uh, don't look at the phone. I have a time of digital detox and I look outside. I've started watching sunrises and sunsets um, and uh, either one, Every day I did a challenge um, to make a habit of it. So I did a 30 day challenge to make sure I saw one or the other every day. And uh, that has been um, very helpful. I also um, have started to do um, uh, more uh, in the way of um, both seated and walking meditations in part by finding new places. I drove um, to a spot in Palolo and in Kalihi last week, just uh, to the end of the road to find a beautiful tree and um, uh, trying to reconnect with um, things that are new um, and in person rather than online to give myself a break. Thank you again, Maya. You're truly inspirational and having you with us today is a blessing. On behalf of Leeward Community College, the High Cares team, and our affiliate partners, thank you everyone for joining us today. This concludes our webinar for today. Take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. Aloha, be happy.